Hello, my name's Toby Haydock, and I'm sitting in the basement of a Mormon church, recording positively inclined commentaries on episodes of Doctor Who and trying to guess what my special guest's favourite things about those episodes are. Well done for finding me. Hello, I am Ian McLachlan, and I was delighted when I found the Dalek Master Plan was still available to talk about. Well, welcome everybody. It's episode 10 of the Dalek Master Plan, the Daleks Master Plan, uh, the last one of three that we have moving pictures for. Uh, so uh, let's see, uh, should hopefully be slightly easier for me and uh, and indeed for you. So if you have the Lost in Time DVD, uh, I have mine set on the menu page and I have the Daleks Master Plan Escape Switch highlighted and I am going to press enter now. Uh, so, yeah, um, when I was a, a youngster, there was no there were no episodes of the Daleks Master Plan, uh, according to Doctor Who, a celebration. But according to the Radio Times 20th anniversary special, when I worked out which the different episodes, because it only listed the episodes that were missing by their titles, it didn't say what story they were from, which I think was a bad move. Um, I realised there were only probably 10 from the Daleks Master Plan. So in between those two publications, uh, there was a suggestion in my little brain that perhaps two episodes of the Daleks Master Plan existed, which is quite exciting because, first of all, it was a great shock that a story that had 12 episodes would uh, would have none in existence. Uh, and now, uh, so two came back and now we have three from an idea by terry nation it says not not really he didn't i don't think he storylined uh, uh uh much of the bits in between but he just wanted to get his uh just wanted to keep his his mitts on his creation uh and uh and any uh opportunities thereof therein or whatever um this is this is nicely creepily shot by Douglas Camfield. Of course, any Camfield production that we're 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 missing, I think we we miss something usually that's that's dripping with either atmosphere or invention or action or a bit of both. Um, his productions are always very well mounted. He's got a, a good eye. Um, the this episode is not, I would say, the sort of material we're used to seeing him doing. Particularly this, as it turns out to be a sort of. Uh, a, a comic moment so we have uh we have uh, a, a mummy emerging um but uh it, it doesn't take as long to realize this is this is a bit of a daft moment and they don't make any attempt to make it serious because peter butterworth could easily remove the uh the bandages from his own mouth and not have to go um, 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 but that doesn't matter uh it's uh it's a bit of fun uh that's a lovely opening shot on a dalek dome that then pulls back uh, you know obviously on a lens rather than on a on a uh, you know a trundling a move wasn't a moving camera that that was a that was a, a lens pulling back uh to then have Marvik Chen in profile in the foreground well three quarter three quarter profile is excellent uh and he has a beautiful stillness and he acts so wonderfully with his eyes um and, and 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 this is instructive because there have been a lot of these scenes in this story um that have sort of melded into one when one is doing the uh telesnap reconstructions but they are very nicely shot and and, and of course that i like the 60s daleks because they're quite short they're sort of squat and malevolent they're like little bitchy hornets you know or or, or vicious little wasps uh, and Marvick Chen does that brilliant thing there, Kevin Stoney, uh, where he bats the ice stalk away because he is so arrogant that he is in charge of the Daleks, which of course will be his downfall. Um, but it makes for a wonderful dynamic between, you know, one poor actor and, uh, and, and you know, a lot of Dalek, Dalek dialogue that he's had to do for several episodes, um, but he does it very well. Um, doesn't he have a charming, charming face and a lovely sort of comic uh, aspect to him, P Peter Butterworth? Uh, famous, of course, for the Carry On films, but not at this point, I believe. I'm, I'm no expert, but he wasn't, he wasn't a Carry On star by this point. Maybe done a couple of them, I don't know, but, 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 uh, uh, 
um, but but not certainly not as associated uh, as as he uh, as he later would be. You know, when I by the time I knew that Peter Butterworth was in in Doctor Who, I you know it was like, oh oh he's that guy. But the the guy he was that guy from he hadn't he hadn't been when he was in Doctor Who. If that makes any sense, he has the lovely bit doesn't he in Carry On Camping when everything's panned. That's a pound. Uh, the wheezing, groaning sound uh, podcast, uh, which uh, I urge you to listen to, it has a lot of fun with Peter Butterworth charging a pound for everything. Love this shot where you just have the tiny little bit top bit of the of the of the Dalek, and then and and then it sort of it's like the camera finds almost from a distance. It's, it's, it feels like it's put you know the focus is pulled in quite close, uh, and it sort of struggles to pick him up, Mar- Marvick Chen, and it's just a it's just a quick sort of linking scene between these guys leaving where they were and and now being here and um uh peter butterworth doing that that, that sort of lovely co- you know comic it's, they're making no attempt to hide that it's silly that he's he's sort of pulling his yelling uh because he doesn't really want to find the doctor in here he sneaks off and and uh and finds himself uh in dalekville uh, and of course, you know, has to think on his feet and go, oh, yeah, I was looking for you, <laughs> which is the typical sort of duplicitous thing the monk will do. Um, Jean Marsh there had to do some sort of clever acting to suggest that the Dalek hadn't just been slap bang in front of her just off camera. Um, there's a real fury there in uh, in Kevin Stoney as Mavic Chen saying, give me the Terranium Core. And it's beautiful the way that the monk, you know, he's a survivor uh, and he sort of goes, oh yeah, I've, I've brought these guys, they're hostages, honest governor. <laughs> he kick, he, and then he will play as, play himself as as, as their friends uh, later, as his, you know, as their friends of his later on, uh, because he's a yeah, he's a survivor, and he will connive his way, uh, the, the conniving Cadfail he is, as well as the meddling monk, uh, the duplicitous deacon. <laughs> um, and uh, it's interesting how oh interesting box. Um, it's interesting how uh, uh, the doctor hasn't turned up yet and doesn't turn up for a while. Now I don't have this on a counter, unfortunately. My my machine is not good enough, so I, I can't time exactly how long it takes the doctor to appear. But he appears quite late in this episode, and indeed in the next two. And it's and and, and to, he he starts to play increasingly less of a role. Uh, in stories and and you almost get the impression John Wiles who didn't like Hartnell uh, they didn't like each other Um, I think oh that's a brilliant shot by the way that transition from the sunlight into the light reflecting on the Dalek dome that is an extraordinary thing uh, to pull off that's a fantastic feat of the imagination for a multi-camera studio director with the resources that they have to have that vision to go well i've got a i've got a sort of glowing light there but also the the, the, the light reflects off the dalek dome so i could turn the light of the sun into the dalek dome that is a a, a magnificent uh, achievement and really shows why they entrusted camfield who's a relatively fledgling director i mean he's done you know an episode of planet of giants that was that was truncated that was a failure episode four of planet of giants episodes three and four were were deemed so dull that they that they edit the edited them into into one episode which is an extraordinary uh thing to have done and has ramifications uh, as the series progresses that that have actually uh, have an impact on the Dalek's master plan because uh, I think it's one of the one of the reasons for the existence of Mission to the Unknown is that you needed a uh, an episode without the regulars, so we have Mission to the Unknown, which is a trailer for this. Um, but but Camfield has done episode four of Planet of Giants and the Time Meddler, which you know has the monk and is you know is a is a well mounted production, but it, actually it's got some pretty fudgy fight scenes um, and some you know apart from. The monk, the, the the sort of supporting characters aren't aren't particularly memorable, and uh, but it has some great cliff top, um, you know, well realized cliff top scenes, and 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 um, the, the the exterior stuff that's mounted in the studio is really really well done. So you know, Camfield could do realistic. Um, but I'm being slightly distracted because Bernard is chewing his bed. 
Uh, he's been as I've been doing this, my dog has been rolling about in front of me, d- doing all sorts, and now he's got into his bed and he's chewing it. So I'm sorry about that. Um, his bed is directly in front of the television screen. Uh, and this this gives a great sense of scale. I interrupted myself, didn't I? Because I was I was talking about how Hartnell, who still hasn't appeared. Um, is given less and less to do, and and one gets the impression that that John Wiles has sort of said, yeah, we don't don't give him much to do. So here he is. So I don't know how far into the episode we are. And you're about ten minutes. We're about ten minutes into the episode uh, before we see the Doctor, and doesn't he look magnificent in his wonderful hat? Uh, and he's doing because he's on his own. He's doing that wonderful facial acting that Hartnell does. He does a lot of acting with his eyes and with his chin. Uh, and he's great. And it's his birthday today as I record this. I'm recording this in the last minutes of the 8th of January. Uh, and it is William Hartnell, Elvis Presley, David Bowie and Shirley Bass's birthday. Uh, so uh, there must have been something in the air. Now, I, I, so here's Jeffrey Isaac, um, who looking at him here, I don't know if he is the guy that I think he might be, that I've traced through records. He looks, he looks a bit older. He certainly got the, uh, you know, he certainly passes as, uh, I, as I say, we don't, I don't know who he is, so um, uh, we don't know where he's from, but he certainly has a convincing uh, look of, uh, of, of, of somebody from the part of the world uh, that he is portraying. Um, whereas Derek Ware next to him is a, is a, is a, is a sort of slightly uh, short white guy with a wig on. Um, uh but those two characters, Tutmos and Kepren, um, we, I got a feeling we don't ever know what becomes of them. And it seems an awful lot of time to invest in a couple of characters who just sort of vanish. You know, we sort of cut back to them and they do lots of sort of supposing and, and you know, portentous stuff. But they don't actually contribute anything to the plot, really, this episode. That's a lovely Dalek move coming out of the ship and then moving to the side hats off to that uh that number one dalek operator there that was a that was a brilliant move um and oh this yes this is where where hartnell sort of does a does a bit of brokering doesn't he for the terranium core and we still have this 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 uh this lovely sort of ampass where he has what they want so they can't kill him because they might destroy it uh, but he's 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 great at that sort of haughty authority, um, which you know puts the lie to, to to whatever John Wiles is, you know, opposition to him was. I think it was it was more personality rather than rather than doubt in ability. But um, Hartnell certainly is a wayward uh, performer when he's when he's when he you know when he gets flustered. He, you know, the authority, he does lose his authority a, a little bit, even though he usually sort of just about gets himself out of it. But um, when he's when he's got this sort of co- this this posed authority that he has uh, and when he takes his time. Um, and and. And actually, uh, you know, now that we've got that footage of him being William Hartnell, um you know, where he's being interviewed and talking to camera and going, I'm talking into the, the, the dressing room mirror and being interviewed, but not coming across very likably and sort of, you know, gritting his teeth and going, oh, I'm legitimate, you know. Um, it, it sort of shows just how much of his doctor is, is characterization. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a characterized as well as an acted performance. Um, and I think he's rather magnificent. Um, Albeit somebody who does lose his way sometimes. Oh, that's great! One Dalek is is capable is all that is required to exterminate all. And then Marvik Chen does that brilliant sort of look, which again it's a great way of uh, of imp- of giving authority to the Daleks. And you totally buy what that Dalek says, and that musical sting helps. But but Kevin Stoney really sells it. And of course that idea that all you need is one Dalek to kill as many pe- you know to kill everybody. Um, is is something that did become lost later on, and you know when the new series you know came back and it said right, we're going to make one Dalek terrifying. So then when there's lots of them, you're going to really lose your shizzle. Um, I think was a really important restatement of the fact because yeah, it's lovely having loads of Daleks 
on screen but my god isn't it effective if all it needs is one dalek one of these sort of perfect war machines uh 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 capable of you know mass destruction and you know even even at, at this point in the Daleks career they've been sent up a little bit in the chase um which I don't think did anybody any favors even though we've had fun with the chase and do check out the lovely Daryl McLean's tributes to the chase in uh, earlier editions of Happy Times and Places particularly episode 6 where it is a wonderful song um so here's poor old Walter Randall um who uh I seem to I seem to call dies with his legs sort of spread apart rather comically um uh, but he looks good, doesn't he? And uh, it's, it's not much of a part for him, seeing as he played El Akia and Tonila. And uh, and amongst these uh, Egyptian extras is uh, Val Musetti, who is a racing car driver as well as a stuntman. Um, and uh, I think Glenn Witter as well, who ended up being a regular on, on the buses. I think he's an Egyptian slave in episode nine. But uh, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these actors that, that got part cast in these sorts of parts... Um, you know, you know, you pop up, uh, pop up sometimes in the background. Uh, Val, Val Misset is also a stuntman in, in, in the Crusade. Um, but I remember I didn't know he was a racing driver, but I have an old friend who's a racing driver and he mentioned Val Musetti and I went, Valentino Musetti, because that's how he's listed in Doctor Who the early years as one of the Egyptian slaves. Uh, uh, and I was like, oh, wow, that's, you know, he's 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 been an extra in Doctor Who. Um, I... I like I, I I I like Hartnell's Doctor's intelligence here, and and the way that this is shot because you know he's only visible through a sort of chink in the set. Uh, it's it's actually very intelligently shot here because they don't have an awful lot of space to play with, but it doesn't look clunky. I mean we've got we've got latest, you know we've got episodes of Warriors of the Deep where there are sort of laser gun fights where everyone's really jammed close together on a set and you're fooling nobody, but this this makes really good use of the set and and tells the story of you know the doctor and chen and uh, the daleks not being able to exterminate the doctor because there are things in between and then the timely arrival of uh, walter randall and his egyptian troops means that the daleks can't chase and kill the doctor yeah look walter randall's legs go really far apart he does, i mean he's doing a you know he's doing a reasonable sort of death acting it's just um death can sometimes look quite comical um uh so this is all on film uh so this is this you know this will have been done well in advance to give this episode its sort of showcase moment uh which means that yeah we've got some lovely smooth movement from the daleks but uh it's not it's not one of the more glorious film sequences because it's you know it's a handful of extras chucking spears um but but it's a nice set. There's a you know you can you can tell that's a back cloth these days. But I I I actually think that's that's no that's I think that's really passable and and uh, and gives the thing a nice sense of scale. Uh, the perspective is very very good. Um, so it gives this gives this episode a little sort of bit of epic battle. But of course we're we're rather divorced from it because well I don't think we see Kipren and Tutmos again. So the only Egyptians we know are extras. Um, this is quite fun to see them getting one over on the Dalek by um, uh, stopping it with rocks, but it it sort of comes to nothing. So it it, it seems to me a, a slight sort of squandering of resources, really. Um, you, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the important part of this episode, of course, is that unlike oh, it's another chase where the the good is just about get away. We can tell we're building to the climax now because the Doctor has to admit. Well, yeah, but I, you know, I couldn't fake the handover of the Terranium, so they've got it now. Uh, but he's got the directional control of the Monk's TARDIS, so we're going to go back to Kemble, where this whole thing began. So it's starting to feel like, OK, we're we're getting to the season finale. I know this isn't the season finale because this isn't this isn't at the end of the season, but it's, you know, it, it's it's it, it feels like a season of its own the Daleks master plan really in the sense that it takes place over over three months you know um so he's he's outwitted the monk which is quite nice um I'd always thought the monk well, I hadn't always thought but I'd I'd had an inkling originally that the monk was stranded on the ice planet but he's not at all is he he says I think well listen out he says something like you know I'm 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 just don't have as I I'm as out of control as you are now so um 
and but I'm sure when I was younger, I, I thought the monk had been had been abandoned on the ice planet. But no, no, he's just he just uh, doesn't know. I, I, that's a really friendly way that Hartnell sort of pats Stephen. They've got a lovely smile between them all. They're going on. Um, uh, Sarah's not the cold killer she was introduced as, was she? So here's the monk making good his escape, and Peter Butterworth, I seem to recall, has to do a lot of talking to himself, which um, which is which is quite hard to do. And indeed, it doesn't happen in Doctor Who all that often. Tom Baker has to do it in The Deadly Assassin because he's, he's decided he doesn't want a companion. But um, but I, I don't know. For some reason, Peter Butterworth gets saddled with a lot of yeah, sort of ex, ex, explaining things, um, chatting to himself. But it works because he's 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 good at it because he's a good actor. Um, and we see that the the the, the takeoff uh, off screen, which is. Uh, which is fine, and and here we have Marvik Chen in control, cause he has the Terranium core. <laughs> yes, yeah, so all this hysteria is unnecessary. Yeah, that's marvelous. So, uh, the baddies have what they want, which means that, um, yeah, this story is is now you know doesn't need any interludes in you know interesting albeit um not hugely impactful on the plot locales um and it's odd isn't it that that both episodes five and ten which were the only two episodes that existed for many years are, are amongst the least representative of 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 as well no i suppose episode 10 is quite representative of these you know eight nine ten mi middle installments but perhaps least representative of the the better aspects of the dalek master plan i suppose uh you know episode two represents the bookends one and two and eleven and twelve five is is the sort of terry nation earthy stuff and and ten is the dennis spooner you know the chase part two so i suppose everything is represented apart from the christmas episode but um Oh, and Hartnell looks great in his spectacles. Uh, I do like my doctor in spectacles. Uh, Davison in Frontios and when David Tennant puts them off, spectacles are great for doing. I'm a testy eccentric that has something to say acting. Uh, imagine what Kevin Stoney could do with spectacles when he does what he does. I mean, he's, he's doing something with a tin of beans there that, that's uh, that's playing the Terranium core uh, and, and what he does with a false fingernail. Uh, or a pencil. Imagine what he'd do with glasses. He'd have a whale of a time. Um, so here's uh, yeah, we're gonna have another monologue from dear old uh, dear old Peter Butterworth, who's uh, landed in the opening titles of the Ice Warriors. Uh, looks a bit a bit reminiscent of that, isn't it? Um, never to be seen in the the, the show again. But um, a lovely yeah, a lovely sort of piece of continuity a lovely uh, a lovely beginning of the sort of universe building of 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 the big vast canvas of doctor who um he got such a lovely he died very young didn't he my favorite story about him was that he uh, he auditioned for the movie the wooden horse uh which was about prisoner of war camp and an ingenious way of escaping by digging a tunnel underneath the exercise you know wooden horse thing uh, and was told that uh he wasn't suitable because he wasn't athletic enough, but he'd actually taken part. He'd been part of the actual uh, uh, es escape attempt, escape plan that, that the film was based on, the real life events. But so so even back in the day, uh, you know, you, you you had to be sexier than, than the reality in order to get some some parts in movies. Uh, but he uh, he did a lot of comedy instead and, uh, and had a great career, but died very, very young um comparatively um and there we have the end of uh the moving pictures of uh dalek's master plan we didn't see kepra and tukmos again did we so that seems a bit of a waste to invest you know even if we just had them killed or you know or and actually we didn't see what happened beyond um the slaves um bricking the dalek up did we either so yeah uh, you know, I, I love the fact that we've got this episode and there's so many lovely directorial flourishes. Um, but I, I, I can't help feeling that if we got next week's, <laughs> I'd be a bit happier. But uh, we, one always wants what one doesn't have. Um, 
I don't think I really choose this, but I I I have to choose. Uh, and it's a nod to the great work that he's done throughout, but it's very difficult because we can't see a lot of it. But Douglas Canfield is is obviously a, 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 a high quality director. I've got to choose that bit where the sun, um, uh, you know, bleeds into the the reflection of the Dalek dome. That that segue from one scene to another, which I think so such great visual flair and imagination, and and you know has to be has to be done as live in the studio, vision mixed, you know to the nth degree and is a is a bravure a piece of uh of, se of segueing um that is you know that, that is you know seconds of screen time but uh, the effort that's gone into that and the the intelligence and and flair behind the just even thinking of it uh so i am gonna choose that although i did love i did like hartnell's uh sort of face off Go, you know, going. I'm, I'm now standing behind a thing, and Marvik Chen's got to come here. I am now giving the thing to Marvik Chen, and then he scampers off. I think Hartnell's performance in all of that stuff was great, and Hartnell looking brilliant in his hat, um, and of course, uh, Kevin Stoney thwacking the Dalek eye as well. But uh, you know, I could easily choose Kevin Stoney uh, every week at the moment. But no, I'm going to choose that that bleed from one scene to the other. What has Ian K. McLachlan? Uh, uber fan extraordinaire from back in the day um i mean still a fan but uh, he was he was he was one of the originals you might say what's ian's favorite bit about escape switch and then we we continue with the escape switch and continue with the monk and the monk ends up on a planet of ice towards the ending now you always you always at that time worried would the monk escape could the monk come back and I would say that the monk was the first humanoid um, character in Doctor Who to um, re make a return visit. And that's what he did. And he was stranded once again because the Doctor had taken a piece of vital equipment from his TARDIS, which meant that, sadly, the monk was stuck. But would there be another encounter of the monk? Well, I don't think. Some people have postulated that the monk might have been the master. I don't think he was. He was a renegade time lord. He was more a mischievous maker than anything else. He was a much kinder character. He was not sinister like the master. Uh, I don't think he was uh, anything but a renegade time lord. And uh, you hoped he would be back. Sadly, Peter Berthaber didn't come back. Right. So if I've got that clear... Uh... I, it's a sort of general monk, the monk ending up on the ice planet thing. I think it was a nod to the monk and, and the monk being, being um, you know, the first sort of returning semi-regular. And yeah, um, and I, um, I was, even though I didn't mention it in my roundup then, uh, uh, I, I think, yeah, I, I could easily have mentioned the monk, but I, I try, if I can, avoid going that character and that actor because uh, otherwise I just choose that all the time. But I certainly have no objections to Ian choosing uh, the monk i think that's a that's a perfectly fine choice and butterworth certainly earns it uh, but it means my winning streak of two in a row uh uh has lost but i don't care i th i love that tiny little moment of uh, of light to light of uh, reflection to reflection i uh, you know it's it's a it's an honor to be able to mention it and and just shows actually how much we're missing that I'm I'm eulogising there, you know, mere seconds. Well, how many mere seconds are we missing because we don't have the moving pictures, no matter how brilliant the uh, the reconstructions are. But anyway, no, I I I'm happily tip my hat to uh, to Peter Butterworth's uh, meddling monk as well, who I don't think is the master either. I think they're you know they're completely different characters, and yes, the Doctor has different characters when the Doctor regenerates, but I. Um, I just don't see why anybody would want the monk to be the master. I think they fulfil very different functions, and and the monk is there, I think, for for much more sort of japery and capery sorts of adventures, which uh, you know I think the show is ripe for, and uh, and uh, and it would be lovely if uh, if uh, there was a if there was a place for a sort of light-hearted uh, caper uh, for the monk to come back in uh, on television. I know uh, they've they've had they've done great things with him uh, with Big Finish. So look. Um, we're going back to Kemble, the abandoned planet. We're going back to Kendall with Magic Chen. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, for the fi- final two episodes, which I think the story is really building up to. Um, and I, I recall both of these episodes being, you know, really, really good. So I'm looking forward to that because I, I have been very nervous about doing the Daleks Master Plan. It's very long. And <laughs> so I hope um, this has been uh, interesting so far. And uh, let's uh, see what happens uh, as the story reaches its pretty horrific conclusion and we get some delegates next week but uh, bye bye Egypt and um, sorry Tutmos and Kepren nobody's nobody's wants to talk about the monk coming back I'm afraid you're you're just gonna have to stay in Egypt with your bricked up Dalek Um, but until next time um, Bernard is still rubbing himself on the carpet rubbing his head and his ears uh, on the carpet quiet at the back Um, well uh, I'm going to press my very own escape switch uh, and I will rematerialize into your ears uh, in a few days' time. But until then, thanks very much for listening and watching and goodbye. Well, thank you very much for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydock. My special guest for the Daleks Master Plan is Ian K. McLachlan. I'm indebted to the many patrons who make these podcasts possible, and they include Ruben Herfindahl, Luke Atkins, Peter Adamson, Kevin Ashelford, Will Brooks, Richard Byatt, Robin Bland, Alex Kaffajoglu, Paul Carnahan, Andy Case, John Curley, Mark Dakin, John Ellidge, Gary Gillett, James Gould, Lisa C. Greco, David Green, Dave Hoskin, Jessica Jones, Andrew Jordan, Ashley Knight, Clive Lewis, Guy Lambert, James Lark, Gavin McLean, Nathan Martin, David Matthewman, John McClay, Ross McPhillips, Stuart Mitchell, Nathan Moore, Matthew Newton, Dave Owen, Melvin Pena, Keith Perry, Jonathan Potter, and Kevin Parker. The music is by Dave Gates and the artwork by Dylan Patterson. Oh, well, look, if you too would like to be a patron, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke. That's where all the action happens, if by action... Uh, you mean six different financial tiers, starting from £3 a month, which allow you access to bonus material, advance releases and other sorts of goodies. Most of those goodies are available at the lowest £3 tier, although there are inducements to lure you further up the ladder. However, if you sign up for a year in advance you get 10% off. So that's patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock. However, nobody necessarily wants to make a monthly commitment, and I understand that. So you can do the Kofi thing, which is to just do a one-off donation whenever you like at kofi.com forward slash Toby Haydock. But hey, times are tough, and I'm just grateful to you for listening to these things. And so if you want to support without doing so financially, that's easy done. Go to iTunes and give these a five-star rating and perhaps a couple of lines of review as well, which will uh, help to separate me from the crowd and just uh, tweak my algorithms so they just look a little bit more algorithm-tastic to passing algorithm voyeurs. Uh, Yeah, I didn't like the way that went either. Anyway... Do those things what I just said, and I will be very grateful. Ta. I'm also a stand-up comedian, and I'm in Manchester every Tuesday at 8pm at XS Malarkey Comedy Club, where I've been for the past 24 years. It's an award-winning comedy club that runs on a non-profit making basis. So that means there is me, and there are also four or five comedians from the national comedy circuit, Uh, at a ridiculously small entry fee, but we get some quite famous names and lots of comics have played there over the years, including Sarah Millican and Justin Morehouse and Jack Whitehall and Alan Carr and even very, very recently we've had Joe Lycett, uh, Russell Kane and uh, our online version at twitch.tv forward slash excess malarkey. Well, we get uh, acts from all over the world because we are not fettered by geography because we're at 8pm on the first Sunday of every month at twitch.tv forward slash excess malarkey. That's absolutely free, although there is a donation option available. Dum, 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 dum. Oh, see, that's because the music was 
already there. I haven't laid it on afterwards. I'm doing this as live. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm actually getting quite good at it, I like to think. I'm timing it pretty well to the music. It used to be, I'd stop a bit, start a bit, move the music, boom, boom, boom. Now I've just got it all laid out and I have to speak in time to the music. Uh, oh, it's the no beginning to my talents. Well, I can't tell you because actually this week I've signed a non-disclosure agreement. What? You, you have, Toby? How exciting is that? I know. What have you signed a non-disclosure agreement for, Toby? Well, I can tell you, can't I? OK, so this week I signed a non-disclosure agreement for 